Okay, so it's going to be two, two, two parts and the two, two different lectures. So in, in the first part, I'm primarily talking about arguments for the non-existence of the external world. And then after the break in the second part, we are going to look at the, the whole thing in a bit more abstract manner, um, asking whether there can be any ultimately true theories of reality at all. And um, just as the spoiler alert, the answer to both is going to be no. Okay, <laughs> so if you don't want to know the arguments, you can leave now, right? Because you know what, where, it's, where it's all going to end. So, okay, so let's, let's get started. So, when we are um, talking about uh, uh, denying the existence of the external world, I should probably, first of all, tell you roughly what I, what I mean by that. So, I don't mean a kind of Berkeleyan idealism which that says all things are only mental, so there are really no physical objects. Um, and it's only the case that we mistake mental objects for physical objects, right? So that's, that's not the, what I mean by denial of an, of an external world. So I'm interested in the more general denial of objects that exist independently of human interests and concerns whether such objects are tables or chairs, or in Buckley's case, divine ideas, right? So for, for somebody like Buckley, uh, there, there would be an external world, it's just the external world is mental, yeah? Um, and for, for, the, for your standard, standard materialist, there's an external world, the external world is, is material, yeah? But what I'm interested in is actually a theory that tries to undercut the, the, the fundamental assumption that there is some stuff that exists independently of us, independently of, of our interests and concerns, yeah? whether that stuff is mental or um, physical. Now, the, the question that I get also often asked in this context when I, when, I, when I talk about this idea is whether my position is a kind of ontological agnosticism or is it ontological atheism, right? So let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, so um, ontological agnosticism would just be the, um, would just be the um, idea that uh, we can't have secure knowledge of whether or not there is actually something out there, right? So we just have to, if one, once we've looked at all the arguments, we just have to suspend judgment and we have to say, well, we don't know. In the, in the same way in which a theological agnosticist would say, well, we can't really know whether God exists or not. I mean, there's some good arguments for the existence of God and there's some good arguments for atheism, but nothing is really decisive. So all we can just say, well, I don't know. Yeah? So we have to suspend our judgment. Yeah? And then, of course, there is the, the, um, uh, the ontological atheist who's going to uh, uh, present a, a, a stronger position, who's going to say, no, we can actually have an, have an argument for the claim that there are no such things, right? There are no external objects, in the same way in which the atheist is going to say there's no God, right? And we can prove that there is no God. We don't have to suspend judgments. Um, Right. I, in, the, in this talk, I set out to uh, argue for the stronger, for the, this ontological atheist position, saying that we can have good reasons to deny that there are any objects independent of human interests and concern. Right? And if I understand Don Hoffman's position correctly, which I'm, I'm not entirely sure about, I think his, he is more in the former camp that says, well, in the end, we don't really know what kind of things there are out there. Um, uh, and we really have to, you know, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to see as far as we come with, with scientific methodology, but then we, have, we, we basically have to stop before answering the final question, and then that's, we have to suspend judgment. Yeah? So that would be, I mean, I don't want to attribute that view to him, but that's, that's how I understand him. Um, so this is a kind of weaker position than the one I want to, want, want to talk about today. So, um, and we'll see how far we get with that. Um, so, in a, in, a, in a sort of nutshell, my main reason for this stronger ontologically atheist claim is that um, such entities, that such external entities that exist independent of human interests and concerns, uh, wouldn't do any explanatory or theoretical work. And when we are faced with the choice of whether or not to accept such entities, it's methodologically pref preferable not to do so, right? So if you have a theory and then you realize that you sort of one, one wheel in the mechanism doesn't actually do anything apart from turning, you think, okay, you construct, construct the entire mechanism without that wheel, yeah? And so that idle wheel, I would argue, is also the, expl the, the assumption that they are things that exist independent of human interests and concerns, right? So that's the, that's the kind of, um, goal, the theoretical goal I'm, I'm going for. But uh, before we get to that, um, of course, we'll, we'll have to see why that would indeed be the case. We have to argue that the postulation of objects independent of human interests and concerns is indeed dispensable. Yeah? And that is a pretty big task. And um, uh, I'll spend most of this talk actually in trying to make this claim plausible. Yeah? Okay, so, and 
I'm going to look mainly at two arguments against the existence of an external world. Um, and um, <coughs> these two arguments are the other ones that you see here on the slide. One is that key features of our worldview that seem to necessitate the external world do not in fact do so, right? So we might think that there are certain assumptions that we make about our everyday reality that necessitate that there are external objects, but uh, in fact that is a mistaken idea. No? And the second point, the B point, is that def defensible, epistemology, uh, sorry, def defensible epistemologies can only postulate an external world in a very thin sense. Yeah? So if we think about our best theories of knowledge, our best epistemologies, then we realize that the external world they, they um, have to postulate is, is an extremely uh, thin and insubstantial notion which we can't really use in order to make it bear the weight of, uh, of objects that exist fully independent of human interests and concerns. So, and as a conclusion of those two, we are then aiming for the uh, claim that therefore the assumption of an external world is dispensable. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how certain properties of the world that seem to be only explicable by assuming the existence of mind-independent objects can in fact be explained without them, that's point A. And secondly, we'll see that the most promising theories of knowledge philosophers currently defend assume the existence of such objects, but that they do so in such a minimal sense that we can in fact get by without them. Okay, so let's talk about A first here. Yeah? And so the main question is, why do we think we need to uh, postulate the existence of an external world? And there are at least two intuitive reasons why you could think we need that. First of all, to explain the appearance of externality, right? So there, there appears to be all that stuff around me that is pretty independent of uh, my interest and concern. So if I wasn't here, I think this tent probably would still be here. That's the first point. And the second point, is that we use it to explain dif the difference between veridical and illusory states. Yeah? So, um, in particular, we are using the idea of uh, objects that exist uh, independent of human interests and concerns in order to explain why the external world around us seems to be coherent, right? So, it seems to be a non-contradictory story where everything hangs together. Um, also, we want to explain why there is such a thing as intersubjective agreement, right? So I can see this watch here and you can all see this watch, which is would be difficult to explain if there wasn't a watch. And um, finally, of course, the notion of efficacy, right? We can, um, uh, uh, things in the external world seem to have some sort of causal and external, uh, causal and external efficacy. How do we explain that if these things don't exist, right? Um, okay, and um, so let's, let's have a look at how strong these two reasons for defending the existence of external things really are. Well, I think we can deal with this point here, that we need an external world to explain the appearance of externality. We can deal with that fairly quickly. Um, because that it's, it's not a very strong point, as there are all kinds of epistemic situations where we have the experience of objects independent of human interests and concerns, while there are in fact no such objects, right? Dreaming is probably the most uh, obvious example, hallucinations and um, specific kinds of virtual reality, they are all contexts where we um, actually have the impression that they are things independent of, our, of us, our uh, desires, concerns, our cognitive states, the, the, say the, the reality we interact with in, in a dream. Uh, but of course there are no, no such things. Nobody assumes that you know, when you are chased by a tiger in a dream there is really some kind of ontological entity which is the dream tiger such that your dream is about that. There is just no thing, it's only the process happening in your mind. Uh -huh. Okay, so I think this one, is a, the second point, is a lot more interesting. Um, and. Um, that is that an important feature of the world seems to be a distinction between states that are veridical, like waking life, and illusory states like dreams, or perceptual illusions, like you know, bent sticks, and mirages, and tinnitus, where you hear a sound in your ear that isn't there, and so on. So recourse to mind-independent objects allows us to explain this by supporting uh, the claim that veridical states are coherent in themselves and with one another, different people agree on them, and they produce substantial effects, right? 
So if there were no objects of uh, independent of human interests and concerns, the whole veridical illusory distinction would collapse, right? But this seems to be a pretty stable distinction about how we think about the world. So the, the, the opponent argues such objects must exist because if there was uh, if there were no external objects, then we wouldn't make sense, we couldn't make sense of these very strong intuitions we have about the world around us, coherence, intersubjective agreement, and efficacy. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.